Well, today I'm going to talk to you about turning your trials into triumphs. Now, for all of our moms, this is something that you can identify with, especially because every mom has trials. Every mom faces difficulty just in trying to raise another human being. The fact that you are able to carry a human being in your body and deliver a human being through your body and feed a tiny human being with your body and then just about lose your body trying to raise that little human being, you are absolutely amazing. And we want to just say thank you to all the moms in the room and online. We're very grateful. But I was thinking about this. We're talking about trials. Moms in particular, I know that moms, they like pretty things. Moms like beautiful smelling things. My wife, oh, she loves things that smell good. And if she thinks something doesn't smell good, even if she hasn't smelled it yet, oh, she starts getting, she, oh, that smells bad. How do you know you haven't even smelled it yet? She's like, no, no, I, I've raised three children. I know that that does not smell good. And so moms, they like pretty things, they're, they're lovely, they're tender, they're loving, uh, much more loving than dads, not that dads don't love their kids, but you know, dads are vaguely aware of some small people living in their house, and uh, moms are aware of every little thing, every detail, every calendar thing on their kids. And here's what I believe, moms have to be tough. We don't talk about the toughness of moms too much. We talk about the tenderness of moms, but moms have to be tough. I was thinking about my mom and how tough she had to be to raise me. I remember her saying numerous times, if I can ever get you to 18 years old in one piece, I think that I will have won a victory. And I didn't really know what she meant by that until I got a little older and realized how many times she had to take me to the emergency room. Uh, The first time she took me to the emergency room, I had an arrow. Yes, an arrow. We We weren't living in the Old West, okay, but one of those play arrows that has the rubber stopper on the end of it. But I had bit the end of it off, had it in my mouth, and was jumping on the couch with an arrow in my mouth and fell off the couch. And, you know, that's what's wrong with me, okay, in case you're wondering. And the doctor said to my mom, he said, uh, oh, your son is okay, but I may have to give you a tranquilizer before you leave. So moms have to be tough. I I got my hand cut, uh, my finger cut off, my hand almost completely cut off when I was just a two-year-old, almost three-year-old boy. I had multiple surgeries growing up, not because I was a sickly kid, but because I was an accident-prone kid. I cut my knee with a hatchet because I was trying to build a fort in the woods. I don't know what I was doing. I was only eight years old, and I was out there trying to be Daniel Boone, and uh, instead of hitting the tree, I hit my knee. I can just go through all of these things. I had to be taken with sports injuries. I had my head split open. I had to have it sewed up multiple times. I just know this. My mom had to be tough, and so do you. If you're gonna raise kids, you got to be tough. I think about my great-grandmothers. I had two grandmas and, and knew them a lot. And then my, I had four great-grandmothers. And I got to meet all of them, hang out with them, remember them. And man, it was just some amazing stuff. I used to love to hang out with them. My uh, grandmother lived the oldest. All of them lived to their 90s. My great-grandmother grandmother lived the oldest. Uh, her name was Maud Hutchins. And she died when she was 96 years old. She was born in 1894, 1894. And I can just remember her telling me stories of when she was growing up and there were no airplanes and the first time she saw a car and there was no electricity. And uh, this was a tough, tough woman. When she was 70 years old, you know what they caught her doing? She had climbed a ladder into the top of a tree in her yard and was topping it with a chainsaw. And I think of some of those old women like that from those days, and they were tough. 
And moms, you have to be tough as well, but it's not just toughness. You need to be able to take those moments in your life. As a mom, you're gonna face them. You need to take those moments that are scary, those moments that are challenging, and it's not just with your kids, it's life in general. Can we all agree that sometimes life is tough? Yes, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, but sometimes you, that's a little more challenging to quote that verse on some days, right? I mean, the fact is we all have trials. That's what I'm saying. And so today I wanna to talk to you for just a few minutes from this psalm about turning your trials into triumphs. We all face trials. We all face challenges. That's just life. You're gonna face them. If you didn't face one today, just hold on. You're probably gonna face one tomorrow. I'm not trying to be negative in my outlook. I'm just trying to show you that you have to be prepared for when life throws a curveball because life does not always go like we plan it to go. And you got to learn to turn those trials, those challenges into victories through trusting in God. So today, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about turning trials into triumphs. Moms, I apologize ahead of time on Mother's Day using a sports analogy. Uh, but it, it's one of the things that I thought illustrated what we're talking about today very well. Uh, in 1989, actually January 21st, 1989, Michigan Wolverines, the college basketball team, was playing the Wisconsin Badgers. Now, I know for most of you, you probably don't care. But let me just kind of explain to you what was going on. Uh, this game had come down to the last seven seconds. The starting point guard for the Michigan Wolverines, his name was Ramil Robinson. And uh, he was a great great basketball player, but he was fouled with seven seconds to go in the game, and his team was down by one point. He got two free throws. He got a step to the line, and with thousands and tens of thousands of people in the stands watching him and the pressure on him, he had a chance. If he hit both free throws, he was the hero, and they won. If he missed both free throws, he was the goat, and they lost. And Ramil Robinson stepped to the free throw line with all this pressure on him, people watching him, and he took the first shot, and he missed. In his mind, he was thinking, well, at least I can hit the second shot. The game will go into overtime, and we'll still have a chance to win. He stepped up to the line again, and he shot, and he missed. A great challenge, a great defeat, Great difficulty. He struggled with that. He was so downcast. He was so upset. He let his teammates down. Uh, he let his university down. He was so hard on himself. But he took that defeat. And he said, I can either feel sorry for myself or I can use this as fuel to become better. And he decided he was going to do that. The next morning, before... He went to class before practice. He decided that what he was going to do uh, was go to the gym and shoot free throws for an hour before he did anything else. He shot a minimum of 100 free throws a day for the rest of the season. Every morning, he would shoot hundreds of shots. He got better and better and better and better. Fast forward that same year to April. The Michigan Wolverines were in the national championship game. The NCAA men's championship, March Madness. He was on the biggest stage in the world at that time. He found himself in the exact same scenario, but this time there were only three seconds left in the game. His team was down by one point, and he got fouled. You see, the team they were playing remembered that Ramil Robinson had stepped to the free throw line when the pressure was on and the game was on the line and he had missed in the past. And they fouled him with three seconds to go. And Ramil Robinson 
He stepped to the free throw line and he had a smile on his face like he knew something that nobody else knew. And you know what? He did. He knew that he had trained. He knew that he had prepared. He knew that he had taken something that was a great difficulty, something that was a trial in his life, and he stepped to the free throw line, his team down by one point with three seconds to go, and he hit the first shot. Everybody goes crazy. They handed him the ball again. He hit the second free throw, and he will forever go down as a hero of the national championship team from 1989. And, and the, the, the application to what we're talking about is this. He took a trial, a difficulty, a failure, a challenge, whatever you want to call it. He, did, he took something where he had messed up and he determined that he was going to turn a trial into a triumph. And do you know that God says that you and I can do the same thing? Because I, I don't mean to be a bearer of bad news. You know I'm not that kind of person. But I hate to tell you this. You have failed in the past. I hate to tell you this because we say Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. You have sinned. I hate to tell you this because it might burst your bubble. I have sinned. I hate to tell you this, the person sitting next to you has sinned and they've probably done things you don't even know about. But don't worry, you've done things that they don't know about either. And the truth is, Every one of us has sinned. Every one of us has failed. Every one of us has fallen short. Every one of us has faced a challenge, a trial. But God says, you can take those moments in your life, those failures, and when you give them to God, and when you trust the good shepherd, you can turn the tragedy, the failure, the, the trial into a triumph. And that's what God wants you to do with your life. And we're gonna see that from the single verse we're gonna read today in Psalm 23, verse five. Before today, we've talked about, the first week we talked about the kind of church that God uses. And we talked about still waters and that God wants us as a church to create still waters for others. And last week, we talked about going through the valley of the shadow of death. And we talked about how that there are hurting people all around us. And I issued a challenge to our church that we need particularly to help people uh, in our community help make sense of their finances and help people make sense of their relationships and help people to overcome addictions. And we talked about helping hurting people and how you can be involved and how you can step up. Even when we're moving to a new location, God's bringing us to a new level of ministry and how that you can be a part of reaching out and helping hurting people. Here's what I know about people who are hurt. The best way to get over your hurt is to help somebody else who's hurting. The best way for you to get better is not to get bitter, but to get going. And when you do that, I believe that God will use you and he will bless you in your life. So let's read Psalm 23, verse number five. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole chapter today. It's only a few verses. Uh, but remember that the first part talks about the Lord as a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is where the, the psalm switches gears. You may not have ever noticed this before, but at this verse, it switches from the metaphor of a shepherd to a king. Now get, get the imagery. Jesus as the shepherd Jesus as the Lamb of God, but you know what Jesus is as well as the Lamb of God? He is the warrior king. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's no tender pushover, but rather he is large and in charge. Jesus is the king that is pictured here because what we see in this is that he's preparing a table. Now, this was imagery of a king. Once again, we don't, there's some things we read in the Bible and we don't understand because we didn't live during the time that 
this was written, the people that uh, lived that this was written to. But every person that read this thousands of years ago would have understood that the table being prepared was done by a king. And whenever you had a table prepared by a king, it was an invitation, listen, that was permanent. He didn't just invite you over for a barbecue and send you home. When you sat at the table of the king, he declared that he was going to protect you and take care of you for the rest of your life. Now get the imagery here because God is showing us that he is the loving shepherd, but he is also the conquering king. So when you're facing trials, when you're facing difficulties, remember it's not your strength that matters because he prepares this table in the presence of the enemies. This is incredible language because it's like the enemies are sitting there watching And the king says, oh, you have been defeated, and now I'm taking care of my boy here. Now I'm taking care of my girl here. I realize you tried to defeat them, but I want you to understand, you are forever going to be in prison. You are forever going to be conquered, and for the rest of their life, I'm taking care of my kids. And there's nothing, enemy, that you can do about it. So let's read. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. There's so much beautiful imagery in that. Uh, The ability of the king, the generosity of the king, uh, that he's without limit on his resources, that you are able to live out of the overflow in your life. There are some beautiful, beautiful things. But We're going to switch gears a little bit here. The first two sermons out of this uh, series were focused on doing, doing, what we should do as a church, what we should do as Christians. These next two, today and next week, we're going to focus on being. What kind of church does God want us to be? What kind of believer does God want you to be? Not just what we do, because you know as well as I do, that you and I can get so busy doing things that we forget to be what attracts people to Christ in the first place. We forget to be what God has called us to be. And this is the picture of grace throughout Scripture. You see, the fact is, you can no more live your Christian life apart from the grace of God than you can get saved apart from the grace of God. God's grace, it is his unmerited, unearned, undeserved kindness and favor. He has given it to me freely, not because I earned it. I don't have the ability to earn it. I don't have the ability to earn my salvation. Why? Because I fall short of God's standard of perfection. I'm a sinner. I have sinned. No matter how good I may be, no matter how many churches I may join, that's not enough. So it's not about doing, but rather it's about being. And God has called me to be something before he wants me to do something. And as a result, we see the grace of God in this, that he has prepared a table before me. It's not just a table, it's a prepared table. Uh, He said that he anointed my head with oil. Uh, That in the Hebrew language, for those of you that maybe you're not familiar with church, um, the Bible was not originally written in English. Uh, The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, mostly some Aramaic, and the New Testament was originally written in Greek a long time ago. And so in the Hebrew language, this is in the Old Testament, Old Testament simply before Jesus, New New Testament was after Jesus. So um, in the Old Testament here, uh, in the Hebrew language, this word could be translated not just oil, but oil of gladness. He has anointed me with oil of gladness. You see, God invites us to enjoy his protection and his friendship and his provision. And when we come to his table, it is by his grace that we come to his table. It's not our works. It's not our goodness. God has called us 
to rest in him. It's not how much I do that impresses God. It's who I am that God is looking for. Not that I'm perfect, not that he expects me to be perfect. God doesn't expect perfection. He just wants me to have some progress in my life. He wants me to grow. And before I can do anything effectively, God wants me to be something. He has called me to be the kind of person. He has called us to be the kind of person that is going to show a lost and dying world what it's like, the joy, the pleasure, the blessing of being in a relationship with God. And I really do believe this. He wants each of us to turn our hurts into helps. Don't waste your pain. Don't waste your trials. Turn your hurts into helps. He wants us to be a place where we turn our misery into our ministry. I've seen it happen so many times. I've seen people that were addicted to drugs or some other substance or whatever, and they turn what was a painful point in their life, and they give their life to Christ, and God delivers them, and they turn their misery into their ministry. They learn to help other people. Even though that's a painful thing in their past, even though that's a hurtful thing in their past, they turn their hurts into helps. They turn their misery into ministry, and God wants us to trust in his strength and understand that our weakness will propel us to celebrate his strength. And we can rest in him. Get the picture. He says, you prepare before me a a table in the presence of my enemies. In other words, do you get the picture that the, the person that was writing this was resting? It was, he was not preparing it himself, but it was being prepared for him. God wants us to rest so that he can work God's not against effort. He's not against trying. He's not against discipline. He's not against any of those things. But he is against you trusting in your strength rather than his. He is against you thinking that it depends on you and your determination and your grit and your gumption rather than his strength. Because no matter how hard we try, and there's some people that are more disciplined than others. I admit that. But the fact is, it's not about your discipline. Should you have discipline? Sure, you should. God's not against that. But what he wants me to understand is that he is the one that prepares the table. So I'm gonna just give you three things. I realize that's kind of a long setup. Let me give you three things that we must be if we're going to be the kind of church and the kind of person that pleases God. He says, you prepare before me a table in the presence of my enemies. First thing you got to be is be faithful. Be faithful. The image, as I said, is that of a king that has defeated the enemies. And what's interesting here is that there is no indication that this king was doing this because his subject deserved it. There is no indication in this psalm that the king said to the person that he was preparing the, the table for, oh, You were brave on the battlefield. You conquered the enemy. You did great things. Therefore, you deserve a table being prepared. No, no. Implicit in this, it it shows us that God's grace is freely given. Not because we deserve it, but because he is faithful. We got to be faithful to the gospel. Once again, the core of the gospel is that God can do what we cannot do. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't be good enough to uh, be made right with God. It's because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that is God's grace. And so we must be faithful to the gospel. The glory of the gospel must be front and center in everything we do as a church. We must be faithful. We must also be faithful to God's grace, the gospel and his grace. Once again, this entire psalm pictures God's grace. The sheep doesn't get led to green pastures and still waters because they were award-winning sheep. They didn't win like the county fair and because they got the blue ribbon, the shepherd said, oh, 
you deserve some still water. That's not, what, that's not what this indicates. The fact is, the shepherd did it because of love. The king did it because of love and grace. And so we've got to be faithful to the gospel. We've got to be faithful to God's grace. And then we've got to be faithful to God's purpose. I love the imagery here that God is preparing a table before us. The idea here is that you are facing trials, but God is preparing you for something greater. Every trial, every time you go through the valley of the shadow of death, what is God doing? He's getting you ready for something better. Because that's what trials do. When I was in high school, my dad was our basketball coach for the school where I attended. And um, whenever I played basketball, uh, he took, I don't know, I, I think he was a little bit crazy, to be honest with you, in the way that he would make us work out. I think he took pleasure in bringing me pain personally. It's like, you know, all the things you've done to me, I'm going to pay you back on the basketball court. And I, I'll never forget this. He used to make us, and he used to say this before practices. He said, all right, boys, y'all are going to run until I get tired. And I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't work, right? How about you, we run until we get tired? No, you were going to run until I get tired. And I'm not running. I'm going to sit over here with my whistle, maybe a glass of lemonade. You know, I mean, I'm like, that doesn't seem fair. And he would run us, and he admitted to me later that his goal, this is kind of sadistic, his goal was to make somebody throw up every practice. We would run until somebody threw up. Now, once again, you probably couldn't do that nowadays. I don't know if that's dangerous or not. I just know back in those days, uh, he wouldn't let us have water even. I know that's probably not medically advisable. But back in those days, you know, we were a little tougher than kids are nowadays. I'm just saying, all right? You know, you, know, you hang around. I'll tell you, well, back when I was your age, you know. I used to walk uphill to school both ways in seven inches of snow in the summertime, right? Uh, so, but my dad would do these things, and he would make us run until we retched. He would make us run until we were about passed out. And we were like, can we have some water, please? And he'd be like, no waters for weaklings. You cannot have water. Your enemy doesn't. I think he thought we were like in the Marines or something. I don't know. He's like talking about our enemies and... And all that stuff. I thought that instead of playing basketball, we were going to be killing somebody. I didn't know what we were doing. And man, he put us through the trials. But we began to understand why. I remember the first game we played. That was my senior year. The first game we played, the first half was kind of close. But we were in such good shape. By the fourth quarter... We literally ran them out of the gym. We ended up blowing them out. The interesting thing was that every team we played that year, we beat. And sometimes we'd be down in the first half. Sometimes we wouldn't be ahead in the third quarter. But the fourth quarter of every game, we had more energy. We had more endurance. We had more stamina than the other team. And we won, listen, every single game game that we played all the way and we won the state championship that year. Please clap, okay, because I don't get much of that anymore. See, I realize this is Mother's Day, and ladies, you need to understand, the older a man gets, the better he was, all right? So that's our philosophy. In our mind, we're a legend in our own mind. My, my point, though, is a, is a good one. We went through something tough to make us better. And God will let you go through trials to make you better. You know why? He's got something better for you. But you've got to be faithful. You've got to be faithful. Listen to James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, let me pause and say, anybody ever been under pressure before? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, you know, you don't make diamonds unless they're under pressure. God sometimes lets you go under pressure to make you better. He said, you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open. Ooh, that's good. 
You see, sometimes God wants your faith to be forced into the open. He wants to test your metal. He wants to see what you're made of. He wants you to get better. And believe it or not, he wants you to believe that you can do more than you think you can. A lot of people think that, well, any little pressure comes up, we just have to give up. No, 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 no. God says it's under pressure that your true faith is revealed. And, and so he says, so don't try to get out of anything prematurely. You ever pray, God, deliver me from my problems? I have. And sometimes God's like, no, no. I've got you going through this for a reason. There's a championship for you to win down the road. He said, don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. You know what that gives me the picture of? That God's like, you know what? They need to go through this heat. And uh, after they go through the heat for a little while, you know what? They've been well-baked. That they're ready, they're ready to display. They've been through enough. They're ready to be beautiful. They're ready to help others. They're ready to fulfill their purpose. You see, this is Mother's Day. When I was a kid, I used to make my mom little gifts. And some of the things I would make her were made out of clay that I got out of the bank of the creek down where we live. And uh, my mother did not smoke and I don't know why I did this, but several times I made an ashtray for my mother, even though she did not smoke. I don't know, you know, a little kid, why do you do this? Um, and she always acted like it was the greatest present that she'd ever received because I made it and I put time into it and I showed that I loved her. But you know what? Until that thing got baked, first of all, it wasn't very good anyway, but unless it ever got baked it wouldn't hold up to anything. It wouldn't last. And what God wants me to understand is that I must be faithful. Faithful. Now, I realize that for some of you, um, if I don't finish my outline, your head will explode. Um, so let me, because you have ADD um, or obsessive compulsive disorder, you ever... Notice that when you're my age, I'm 57, uh, when you're my age, they didn't call things that back in those days. Uh, I have discovered, I've taken tests, and it said that out of 20 questions, there were 20 things that were 100% true of me, 20 out of 20 that said I, I had ADHD, and yet I never got diagnosed with that. I just got my tail beat, all right, and that was the greatest medicine in the world. And uh, suddenly, whenever that came around, I got cured of it. But anyway, you, maybe, you're, maybe you're like I am. Maybe you're ADHD or maybe you're obsessive compulsive. Uh, so let me just give you the last two points. I've got a minute and 46 seconds, okay? So I'm not going to extend it out. Uh, you, number two, you've got to be fruitful. He said, you anoint my head with oil. You anoint my head with oil. Anointing oil was preparation for service. So God wants you to get ready to serve. He wants you to be faithful but he also wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to make a difference. He wants you to be effective. And then the last one is he wants you to be full. He said, my cup overflows. And so the last question is this. Are you living out of the overflow or the undertow? A lot of people get sucked in by the undertow. You ever been to the beach where there was a riptide or an undertow? And they would tell you, don't swim in this part because you could get sucked into the riptide or sucked under by the, the undertow. There are a lot of people that I think live their life that way. They just get sucked in by everything. Every circumstance sucks them under. Everything causes them to drown. Every trial, they throw in the towel. But you know what God wants you to do? He does not want you to live out of the undertow, but rather to live out of the overflow. And I know this, he anoints my head with oil and my cup overflows. This oil of gladness, this 
overflowing cup shows me the love and the grace and the abundance of God. And so today, I hope that you will live your life out of the overflow. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.